Um, we're going to get started. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, my name is Mikey Mhenna. I'm the founder of Afikra. Um, I'm going to be hosting today's conversation. So I'm honored uh, to be joined by uh, Pascal Zurbi, who is calling us from Madrid. Um, Pascal is the founder of uh, 29 Letters, uh, which is often written 29 LT. Um, he started the organization in 2006 and is a type designer, graphic designer, and educator. Uh, a graduate of the Royal Academy of Arts in the Netherlands with a master's degree in type and media, um, who, and he did that degree in 2005. He has taught all over the world between Lebanon and uh, UAE uh, and given lectures all over the place. He's a co-authored and edited the book Arabic Graffiti, which was published in 2010. And he was one of the finalists for the Jamil Prize Three. He's been awarded type design competitions such as TDC um, and uh, Granchen, and he's based in Madrid, Spain. Um, Pascal, thanks so much for joining Africa Conversations. Thank you for, inv for inviting me. I'm happy to be a part of the discussion. So, I guess the first question I'd like to ask is more biographical. Um, what was your entry point into type design specifically? Was, were you interested in uh, the words themselves? Or were you sort of an artsy kid as a kid? Um, how did you find yourself specifically interested in this particular visual medium? Well, a, a nice and weird story is that when I was a kid and when I was at school, I always had problems with uh, languages and with uh, uh, spellings and uh, writing. And uh, my inspiration with uh, letters and uh, words and then typography came later in when I was at university. Um, what is strange is that I only got to uh, love and to understand the Arabic language through uh, the Arabic calligraphy and Arabic typography and not the other way around. So when I was younger, I used to not be very, uh, I wasn't a big fan of the Arabic language. Also, maybe because in Lebanon, we are uh, this mix of Arabic, English and French community and we speak all of these languages and our parents tend to speak to us more maybe in French and English than in Arabic. But um, my entry point to typography was at university level. I was fascinated by the idea that how a certain letter can give such visual language or visual interpretation without adding any design element around it. And back then, I was a bit annoyed by the fact that there was not enough Arabic typefaces in the market as much as there is Latin ones. So I was not only me, like most of the designers back then, and there were always uh, this need for new fonts, a new typography, new um, uh, experimentation and type design, and how to make contemporary typographical Arabic fonts and typography, um, like inspiring from the old, making it in a new way, but not breaking away from the essence of it. And this is, was my entry point. I was also taking some classes with uh, Saeed Al. I was lucky that mm. they were still giving Arabic classes in, in the U where I did my uh, bachelor. And um, he just fascinated me by how he spoke about the language and about the, and about the script itself. And he was one of the person that wanted actually to simplify the Arabic and made the uh, yeah, very famously. Yeah. Yeah. Although this wasn't very a good success back then, but just the idea of him going into this idea and wanting to change the script and wanting to change the language, it was a bit like triggering for me. Like, why is this person wanting to ch to change this this the the script so, of the language? And he's also a philosopher and a poet and a writer. Yeah. It made me really go into the idea of what is the link between the language and the script and then there was Nasri Khattar also that also yeah. did and there was these like revolutionary people that made me think of of why is the type is how it is and why do we use it in the way we use it and how we read it and how we speak it and what's the difference between it and I think this was my entry point. So both uh, Saeed and Nasri are largely uh, they I mean, they're both sort of philosophers, obviously, but they're focused on the sort of technological challenges of the language, right? The script yeah. itself and how when you actually implement this uh, this system 
in a sort of, and try to scale it, there ends up being all these technological challenges and ramifications that we need to rethink at, on a societal level. Is this what you were thinking of immediately? Like, man, how the hell are we going to build type? How, how are we going to build printing presses? And how are we going to build, you know, how are we going to code in Arabic? And were you drawn to those uh, dynamics or were you sort of just frustrated aesthetically? I'm a designer and I want better fonts. I you know? Which one was it? I think I was curious about both both aspects. One of the aspects is that what um, like people like Nasir Khattar and Saeed Al and other people, they were more thinking a bit outside of the box, even if they're, uh, they're, uh, what they did back then wasn't accepted and it was a bit far away from the Arabic heritage and calligraphy. But it was an idea that is strong enough to, to be spoken about and went into history. And um, they were challenging the idea of why do we need to use this? Uh, why do we need to use the script or this kind of set of letters? Or why can't we simplify them? Or, or how can we make the Arabic as easy as possible and make it easier for the readers to speak? Both Nasri Khattar and, and Nasri and the Saida, they approached the, uh, the idea of simplifi simplifying the Arabic language mm -hmm. through, through the script. Both of them did it in a different way, and both of them somehow got rejected. But they they marked a certain question that needs to be somehow dealt with. And um, although maybe um, the aesthetical part wasn't covered in a way, it was more about the idea itself. And then now when we have the enough technology to do the Arabic as elegantly as it should be, and uh, we're able to do it uh, without any limitations as it was in the uh, from the 50s until the 80s or whatever um, so it, it 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 only comes about the idea about how how much we can make of a contemporary new uh, certain kind of fonts but still they are linked to the historical element and to the cultural aspect of it and to the reading and uh, custom that Arab people need to be able to read and and use this this type, but at the yeah. same time to make it contemporary and new. And so this this was this was my this was the challenge that I wanted because all the all, all the Arabic fonts that were back then, they were stuck to a certain tradition or they were stuck to a certain technology and they didn't they weren't able to evolve. And I wanted to evolve them. I wanted to to challenge like how much I can go further while staying in the in the certain limit. Okay, so I have I have like two basic history questions. One that predates the sort of like uh, the twentieth century, and one that, that's firmly focused in the sort of computing age. The first is the image that we're looking at right now, which I have first encountered yeah. on your on your blog, uh, you know, many years ago that uh, we talked about earlier, you said is actually from somebody else's book. And you can talk about that in a second, but this, this sort of list of, um, this list of, I don't know if uh, typeface is the right word, maybe it's not the right word, but this list Calligraph of calligraphy. Calligraphic styles. Yeah, this list of calligraphic styles. Is this something that you think of? Are these uh, specific sort of genres that you're constantly pulling from? That's the first question. And the second question is, who designed the basic fonts that existed on my like 19 Windows 95, uh, you know, like Word? Okay. <laughs> like, were they designed here? Who designed them? Well, were there type are... foundries or like wh who did these? Yeah. Who did the the basic fonts? The basic Arabic fonts? Who did them? Did they know okay, any of this start... stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Let's start with the with the image, and then yeah. because the other question is a bigger topic, it's really a big history. I don't know if you can cover it in this discussion, but um, just uh, this slide that you're showing, uh, it shows basically the most common Arabic calligraphic styles, and this is coming directly from calligraphy. Um, it it just shows how how diverse and how uh, f flexible is the Arabic calligraphy and the Arabic mm -hmm. script compared to other scripts, and this is actually a big. Uh, benefit we have as Arabic typographers. It shows the Nasr, the Persian, the Ruka, and the Kufi, there's some missing stuff. And it, it's basically the, the, the idea about 
the different kind of uh, scripts that were developed during the Arab and later the Ottoman Empire, because they were these were the area where all these were developed. As as a type designer, these are our 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 inspiration point. These are our our starting point. Like every time we need to start a new typeface, we need to decide: Are we going to base this typeface on the Nasakh or on the Ruka or on the uh, Kufi or whatever kind of script? We go back to the essence of this kind of calligraphy. And then from that, we build on it. And then at some point it changes, it becomes different, it becomes new, it becomes cont contemporary, whatever. But if you really want to stay in line with the Arabic script and keep it in line with the aesthetical values and heritage of the script, somehow you always need to start from, from these styles and you go, f you go further from it. Okay. So always, I always say that my always my inspiration points are the old manuscripts and the calligraphic styles and uh, and the calligraphic, and that's also I always stress to everyone that needs to be a type designer that he needs to do a bit of calligraphy workshops, he needs to read a lot about the different calligraphic styles and need to understand the historical element of every one of them. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, no, that, that that makes a lot Moving, of sense. That yeah. makes a lot of sense, which connects to the second question, which I'm trying to imply is the, se the second question, did they also reference these? Did they have a sense of historical context or was it somebody in San Bernardino just writing, <laughs> creating this stuff? No, the other section is that when we move to technology, yeah. um, it's a big it's a big history of technology. Like we start with the, so at the beginning, everything was handwritten and yeah. um, later uh, books were starting to be printed using the, the press and the movable type. And then later we came to the, to the typewriter and the monotype machine and the linotype machine with the, with the press. And then we became to the primitive computers and then we became to the bit more advanced. And then later we became to the advanced open type features and other scripts. So what, what, what happened is that most of the previous technology starting from the movable type to the typewriter to the early printing technologies, they are mostly based, they were mostly designed to serve the Latin script, like more like the Western languages. And they were designed to answer the needs of the Latin script, which didn't uh, cover all the needs of all the non-Latin scripts or the old scripts of the other parts of the world, like Arabic, Indian, Chinese, Japanese, mm -hmm. all the others. The idea is simple because the Latin is, is very somehow made to become detached. It's one letter per shape. You have only like lowercase, uppercase, but this is only the different alternates. When, it, when you move to other scripts, you have more like script approach. You have the baseline linked. You have the different kind of letter, letter collections. And this makes a, a bigger technological problems for the for, for this script and they weren't able to cover them or to solve them by these technologies. And this made the problem uh, or raised the question of how to simplify the Arabic, how to make it fit into these technologies, how we can make an Arabic type fit into a typewriter keyboard or how can we make an Arabic type fit into the limitation of a, um, a linotype machine or a monotype machine or whatever it is. And that what it came the idea of simplifying, simplifying the Arabic script. And this happened with the start of the typewriter and then to the primitive computer and then to the later computer. We, we tend to say that what, what was happening is that the most common were the mastery nasakh typefaces, meaning like all the baseline was on a straight baseline, not any more fluent. Mm -hmm. And then some of the basic shapes were simplified like the for example, uh, like the like the ha, for example, like the ha has the initial, medial, final, and isolated form, which are different. Yeah. And then they were simplified that instead of having four different shapes, we, we make the initial and the medial the same, and then we make the final and the isolated the same. They just matter of linking them or not, and then we reduce the number by already half, like the character set. Then we make them fit on the typewriter or whatever it is. So the, the problem in brief, we cannot really go deep into it. The problem that until we, we got to open type, which was in the nineties, all what was before happening, it was simplified version of the script and it suffered a lot aesthetics of it. 
a separate uh, a lot about having a more cursive kind of approach of having uh, ligatures being uh, placed into the font of having different uh, shapes for every letter or or variants and it made the arabic a bit more stiff it made it more rigid it made it a bit more um, very flat if you want compared to the calligraphy which was very fluent very active very dancing or whatever you want to use the word yeah. for it and um, later what we are experiencing now or for the past maybe 15 20 years is that the technology at last catched up, ca caught up with the needs of all the arabic uh, the word scripts beside latin and now we can have more control about the level of the um, a calligraphic aspect or typographic aspect. There's still we still need more. Uh, there's still few limitations, but at least now we can do a a very advanced uh, Arabic type and other scripts into the Latin. Uh, the idea of who were doing these fonts before, they were limited to ma basically manufacturers. So like um, the linotype uh, uh, company, they had the machines and they sold it with their own fonts that came with it or the typewriter yeah. they made or, or IBM or Casa they, they, So it was the, the type foundries back then, they were linked to, to an industry to a, because they're also maybe like lead pieces. They're not, they were not di digital. They were not very easy to make. Like they were a piece of, of, uh, of object. So yeah. And the, and, the, and, and the back days, they were limited to basically the people who were producing the machines that were able to print or they were able to make these computers. Mostly they were Western companies that were trying to sell to the Middle Eastern uh, people. Some of them, they have some Arabic experts working with them. Some of them, they didn't have Arabic experts working with them and they did it in their own, how they understood it. And that was a big uh, uh, difference between who were successful and who failed in these yeah. uh, manuscripts. Um, so, yeah, we cannot cover it. Yeah, so, yeah. let me. Big, I, I wanna. I wanna. Um, it's a big historical of, topic. So. Yeah, yeah, no. It it gives me a lot of uh, stuff to think yeah, about. I'd like to understand sort of. Let's move now into sort of the twenty first century. Um, so you you graduate from university. You, you do your masters in typography. And you you first start working. Did you immediately start developing new typefaces? Um, was that the first challenge? And you know, is it is it drawn? Is it is this a very commercial business where it's really drawn uh, driven by client requests? Where somebody says, "I want you to match something that matches my brand." How, walk me through sort of the process through which you so start working on a a new typeface. Yeah, so I, I do my master's in the Royal Academy of Arts in The Hague. Mm -hmm. And um, it's one of the most, uh, it's the most professional uh, type design masters in the world. Um, they taught me there how to be a professional type designer. And from there, it was up to me to apply to the Arabic and other people to apply it to different scripts. The idea, what, what you learn when you do a proper master's in type design is that they they really give you all the skills and they change the, your your mentality to be able to become a professional type designer beside being a graphic designer and then it's you would you as as an arab type designer or a chinese type designer or whatever you have to channel this understanding and this knowledge into the script that you are designing and i was lucky that when i was doing my masters Back then, there was still a big demand uh, for new Arabic typefaces. There was not enough yet uh, like professional type designers, Arab type designers in the world. There were a handful back then. Um, and yeah, directly after I graduated, I started doing fonts. I, 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 would, I would say that the ones that I did in the beginning, I'm not anymore very proud of because I was still a bit learning and going through. Until now, I'm still learning about yeah. how to do Arabic fonts. It's really crazy, this, but, this, uh, this career and this. But directly yeah. from, the, from the start, I, I, was, I, 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 I was doing commission typefaces for, for companies in the, in the Middle East that needed uh, some custom typefaces or bespoke typefaces for themselves. At the same time, I started doing my own uh, personal projects and typefaces and publishing them personally. 
So I was also lucky to work with organizations like uh, like Khat, they uh, to do the projects like typographic mat matchmaking and others. I was lucky to collaborate with other uh, colleagues that work in branding agency, branding agencies, yeah. and advertising agencies to do bespoke typefaces. And it was always about teaming up with other experts, uh, either either design branding experts or uh, typography experts. Uh, or different kind of like Latin Arabic, uh, like I worked with uh, people in Switzerland or people in Germany and other people in Europe that needed an Arabic uh, expert to work with their own uh, Thai faces or to do an Arabic for their own funds. So, and it was always a collaboration, either with a with a client or with a typographer, or and it's always the challenge of how to create a new Arabic that matches an Arab, another Latin or how to create an Arabic and a Latin from scratch by itself, which is a different uh, process. Different challenge, yeah. This is a the different challenge. So, or how to answer a branding identity of a... I want to I wanna back up for a second um, to something that you said earlier. You said, I'm not particularly proud or maybe I'm not like, <laughs> entirely proud of some of your earlier work. Yeah. Um, so walk me through as somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about. How, what would make you cringe about your earlier work? Like, how do you identify it? What are the litmus tests? What are the things that you look for um, yeah. in, in terms of good type design when you're thinking about specifically about the Arabic script? Like, what yeah, were you so bad at earlier? What have you it's learned? Like, yeah, what is, what is amazing about the Arabic calligraphy is that, and the Arabic typography is that it's like, the more you know about it, you, the more you need to learn about it. It, yeah. there's not a limit that you say like okay jazz. now yeah it's like there's no limit like you say okay now i'm i'm the master of arabic typography and i'm i know all the different arabic calligraphy and i can now there's no way of saying that even now i'm still learning in a way and every time i do a new typeface i somehow discover new stuff that i didn't maybe knew before about it and what i lacked in my few years like after after i graduated i was I knew, I knew all the skills of the being a professional type designer, but I have to say, I didn't know all the different aspects of the Arabic calligraphy back then and the Arabic typographical aspects. And I lacked a bit of, like it took me maybe like three, four years after I graduated to really understand all the different uh, styles and behavior and understanding of the, of the script. Also, I came back to Beirut and I was working a bit with calligraphers there, Kaza, and. I kept on learning a bit about Arabic calligraphy before I, I felt like I'm mastering it. And I, till I got to this point, I already designed maybe like three, four, five different typefaces in the meantime, in these years where I felt I was still learning. And now looking back at them, I see that maybe some of them, they lacked maybe a bit of understanding of the Arabic contrast or the Arabic pen structure, or maybe I would have drawn this letter in a different way than and how it is drawn or whatever yeah. you know it's like it's like when you um it's like when you when you when you design something as a as a as a as a kid and you look yeah. at it and you see like wow it's amazing like i i did that i'm so proud of it i'm, I'm just amazed by it but then when you've been the grown up and you look at it like what i was happy about this it looks like crap for me now it's, <laughs> it doesn't yeah. work like and then you have to more like refine it and draw it and and so uh, are there okay I've, I've, you're, you're sparking all these other questions so uh yeah. one question is there's this there's this like tradition of um hand hand calligraphers right hand yeah. hand drawn calligraphy yeah is there is there friction and conflict between the, the world of hand-drawn calligraphers and people who are developing new typefaces. In the digital world. And digital world where they're saying like, you guys are missing the point. You're getting this all wrong. You're moving us in a direction that is like disgusting. You're, is, there, is there a friction? There is. I wouldn't say there's a friction. I would say there's mm. different kind of schools in the type design world and the typography world. Um, some of them, some of the scores, they say that, okay, we should be as close as possible to the Arabic calligraphy and we should be as possibly uh, true to the, to the Arabic pen and to Arabic calligraphy. And some, 
like the most extreme of that is that we should be very experimental. We, we should break away from the calligraphic rules. We should do whatever we want to do. And there's the in-between or maybe like all the schools that come in between these two extremes. It is okay, like we are going to inspire from the calligraphy. We're going to learn from the calligraphy, but we're going to reinterpret it as a new typographical element. Um, and the people who are working in the, the two extremes, they have problem with the people in, the, in between. And the people in between, they see the extremes as too much extreme. Like you don't, be, you don't need to be too traditional or you don't have to be too experimental and break away from everything. And these different schools, they might of uh, maybe clash sometimes, or maybe yeah. it's, it's good to be seen that are different diverse ways of seeing stuff. And it's good for the Arabic type, uh, type community or the industry to have all of these options and the people choose what they want to. They, they want to be more traditional or they want to be more, more uh, crazy and experimental or they want to be more contemporary with a hint of, of calligraphy. Um, me, me personally, I place myself somewhere in the middle that I am, um, I'm, all my projects, all my typefaces are truly inspired by, by, by uh, calligraphy, but yeah. none of them is uh, is calligraphic. Uh, all of them, they are this new contemporary typefaces that that stem from calligraphy, that inspire from calligraphy, that learn from calligraphy, but they are not calligraphy. And for me, calligraphy is calligraphy, and typography is typography. Calligraphy is a is a craft, is an art. I don't consider myself as a calligrapher. Um, to be a calligrapher, you need to be practicing calligraphy every day for years for your yeah. hand and your mind to be in a way to, to try to write all, all the different Arabic styles, whatever. And calligraphy for, for me is, a, is more art, if you want to say. It's more like craft by itself. And the digital typography or type design, it's a different world by itself. It is, it is coming from the world of calligraphy, but it's not calligraphy. It's it's this digital new media, uh, whatever you want to call it, that um, stems from calligraphy, but it's, it's, it's not calligraphy. So I don't want to do calligraphy digitally. This is, this is not my job as, yeah. a, as a contemporary type designer. I don't want to reproduce the same uh, calligraphy that is drawn by a calligrapher by a pen on a paper digitally yeah. on the computer. This is not my, this is my, this is not my job as a, as a digital type designer. I want to create digitally new typography, having new spirit, a new feel, new ideas, challenges, typographical elements, all of this stuff. So the people who are uh, into the traditional uh, calligraphy, uh, they might see uh, that the typefaces that we are creating may be a bit breaking away from it or maybe not to the to the level of it and some of them not so it depends so we have different opinions different schools different directions but for me now what i see is that it's not a conflict i, I see it as a diverse yeah uh, as an everyone is free to to think and to do whatever they want and we have to respect each each other's opinion and we have to accept that there's a, there's a need for all of these different digital versions of typography and calligraphy. Yeah. What is fun about it? So as, as a sort of technology uh, has, a, uh, uh, the digital technology has sort of powered some of this work. Yeah. Um, and in some ways it's like sort of democratized as technology can do sometimes it's democratized that work. And there may be sort of new schools that emerge, right? New yeah. school uh, visual styles. Are those visual styles geographically, geographically uh, derived? Like, is there a typographical style that's emerging from, you know, Morocco and Algeria that's very different than the style that's emerging from Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, or is it just um, people sort of drawing artistic um, inspiration and sort of like, are there styles that are emerging, and is there any variety geographically that? that's going on. Uh, interesting. So your question is, 
based on different nations, like people from different nations are doing different styles and not people yeah. that are basing their, their typefaces on different calligraphic styles. Yeah, I wonder, because like, um, if you look at like the artwork, for example, not that this is necessarily uh, like the same as yeah. a painting or stuff, but if you look at the artwork that comes out of pl places, it's inspired and it's affected by the location and sort of the local culture. Is that, have we seen sort of styles that this, emerge? Uh, type design? Yeah, and type design. Actually, is that a ridiculous notion? <laughs> that might be ridiculous. <laughs> Um, to be honest, I never saw it like this or never thought of it like this. For, for me, it was always that uh, all the different type designers now working in, the, in this industry, they are relying on different uh, styles that they rely on or different schools as we spoke about, like the traditional mm -hmm. or the medium. But you're, like, like based on nations or geographically speaking, I never saw it like this because it's at the end, all, uh, all of us in the Arab nation, we use somehow the same, we rely on the same Arabic script, Arabic language. So a type designer in Beirut or a type designer in Dubai or a type designer in Maghrib, can all of them, they have all of the styles to inspire from and they are inspiring from it. Maybe it's some of them, they might inspire from certain research that is based on their own nation or their own heritage, and they can inspire to create a certain typeface from it. Uh, for example, a person in, in, in Beirut can inspire from a certain calligraphic style that was done maybe uh, during the uh, cinema industry mm -hmm. uh, calligraphic of the post, and he can inspire from that that didn't maybe exist in Dubai. Or, for example, another person in Cairo can do that, or Maghrib, or whatever. But I think it's it's based basically it, based on the research point that you want to start from, and not maybe based on the certain uh, nation that you're living in. It's always about what you are inspiring from. What are you researching about to come up with a certain typeface? Yeah, I can okay. think now as an as an as an example. Uh, now me living in Spain actually. Because before I was living in Beirut, then a bit of in Dubai, and now now in Madrid. And when I arrived to to Madrid, I was amazed by the uh, the uh, the Arabic and the Spanish culture that that exists here in Spain. And actually, the last typeface that we pu we published uh, last week, it's called Ocaso. It is inspired by the Al Khamiado manuscripts, which are the scripts that were written by um, uh, uh, the the scripts. They are written in Arabic script, but if, if you read them, they sound Spanish. And these were used mm -hmm. by, the, by the Muslims who stayed in, in, the, in the Iberian Peninsula after, uh, after the invasion or the reconquest of the, of the Spanish kings. And from that, I inspired to make a new uh, typeface. I was looking at these manuscripts and I was amazed by this uh, very unique uh, style that they had that I never saw before. And maybe if I wasn't living in Madrid and I didn't know about this uh, topic, I wouldn't have researched it. So yeah. So maybe this is maybe part of. Yeah. So I have two final quick questions, and then I want to open up to everybody. The first one is: Are you aware of anyone who is trying to continue the work of Saeed Ail to think about that? Is is there, are there any like philosophical descendants? Specifically about Saeed Ail and his Lebanese. Uh, type. I don't think there is. He, Saeed Ael, he, he was more a philosopher and a linguist and a, yeah. and a literature guy. He was, what, what he was saying is that we should stop using the Arabic script and we should move to the Latin script and we add some extra shapes. And actually he was aiming for like a word script that a one kind of script with all different unified, uh, unified shapes yeah. That he he was saying that every phonetical sound will be represented by only one shape and one shape only, and with these shapes, if we cover all the phonetics of all the languages of the world, then we can write all the languages of the world with this one kind of space. What what he what he missed, I think, he missed the idea of the heritage and culture and. And the ideas and that's why he failed uh, or it wasn't successful it was rejected in Lebanon and all over the world the idea can be compared to how Atatürk in, in Turkey yeah, exactly. changed from the like the Turkish language it was written in Arabic 
and then he wanted to make a civil nation and break away from the religious approach and he changed it to the more uh, neutral Latin script. Um, this is somehow what Saida and was thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, on a bigger scope. Uh, I don't think someone is... His is, descendant. Is, no, I don't think. <laughs> okay. But, but it was amazingly... When I was taking his, his, his class, he had these books that he, he uh, at the end of his, his career, he, he published some poems using his, uh, his, his type, his uh, script, whatever you want to call it. And actually we learned it in, in class and it was really easy. He was, he was always focusing on the idea that if you have point A and point B, what is the fastest way? It's like speaking about mm -hmm. science or, 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 or philosophy. Yeah. And indeed, it was easier to read uh, at some point his poems um, using his kind of type, not the Arabic type. And it's it still sounded Arabic when you read it. It's the idea yeah. of this. Uh, it's, it's a it new against, alphabet. Yeah. It again goes to to the to the idea of the uh, of the Turkish and the Persian and also the mm -hmm. Al Khamiado. The idea is that what kind. So, so you have the language and the sounds and you have the script and then what kind of shapes you want to give to these sounds and what is the easiest for people to learn? This was what he was thinking about. It was how to translate a certain sound, like the letter A, it's like it exists by itself as, a, as an entity without even writing it anywhere. It's like, it's like a spirit, it's like a soul. And then you give it a form, you put it in, mm -hmm. a, in the letter A, or letter Aleph or whatever. Yeah. And he was questioning this, like, why do we need to do that? Or why do we need to do it in this way? Why don't we do it? And because it's, it's, it's a mix of philosophy and literature and yeah. typography. It's like, it's a crazy world. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I want to move on um, to these four quick questions and then we're going to open it up to everybody. Um, so very quickly, what are you reading or watching right now? Um, well, since I'm in Spain, I'm now l learning the Spanish language since three years, and I was interested in trying to read some, some more Spanish literature and Spanish books. So because I'm still in a uh, medium level of Spanish, I'm reading some Spanish comics uh, that oh. are funny and easy to read to practice my Spanish. And also I'm, re I'm, I'm reading some Spanish literature, but in English. By contemporary Spanish writers like Javier uh, Javier Marias, I like cool. uh, uh, watching. Uh, I recently started watching a series called Move. Okay. I think on Netflix, and it's about contemporary choreographers and contemporary dancers. They did a, a an and episode it's amazing. on Lebanon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I met these guys in Lebanon when they were here filming, actually. Ah, okay. I didn't get to the one of Lebanon yet. I'm yeah. curious, but it's it's so it's it's so interesting because they speak about contemporary dance and how it inspires from like the classical ballet and whatever, and then they transform it into this very modern movements and dance expressions and body expressions, and so cool. it links a lot to our work as typographers. Like we inspire from calligraphy and we do it in type, but yeah, completely different. Uh, career, but Pascal, I was so hoping you were going to say you're watching telenovelas. I was really, really hoping that, but alas, you didn't say it. So, who would I you shadow? <laughs> I watched some Spanish telenovelas with my okay, my wife. good. So, yeah. who would you like to shadow for a day, past or present? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I have a name in mind, but I, I was. I would say that I would like to shadow someone that is completely different than the design career, maybe like a construction worker, like, uh, or like a dancer or like a, uh, yeah. like a person that does a really interesting kind of structure completely away from design, but who has a very focused and very professional kind of work. Uh, yeah. And it's exact. And this is, this is like inspiring for me. Yeah. Yeah. Exacting work. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work or your line of work? Yeah, um, I think until recently, um, most of my friends and family didn't understand what I'm working about or what I do exactly. And 
people don't understand why do we need to design typefaces or new fonts. Um, they think that fonts exist in computers or in machines or on the web. It's like it's like bread, like like it, it like it's there, like water. Like you open the tab and there's water. You don't think of of where is. And people don't understand that why I spend years or hours or whatever researching and learning to do one typeface at the end. And um, I always try to explain why and how, but yeah. this is always mis misunderstood, like why. So inshallah, you can send them this video and that will help. <laughs> help <them out>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? Um, typographically speaking, I would, yeah, it's, 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 it's again, it's hard, like always my own inspiration it always comes as a type designer, it comes from the manuscripts and the calligraphy that we spoke yeah. about before and the research. I don't think I can name a person okay. um, because there's many, but I would not name. I would say more the research inspires me itself, the topic, the theme. Great. Okay, great. Um, okay, we're going to open up to the uh, questions. We have some questions in the chat. Uh, Noha, I think you're up first. Do you want to unmute yourself? I know. Her. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. So interesting. And um, I would like to ask what you think about um, fonts written by hand. I don't mean calligraphy. I just mean our everyday fonts. You know, every person has mean... their own style of writing. And yeah. uh, I was wondering how you think about that style compared to what you do when you design uh, digital fonts compared to the work of a calligrapher. Yeah, um, well, basically in Arabic, what you learn at schools is the simplified Rukka style, uh, most of the Arabic schools. Um, and it's the more fast, uh, the, the fast handwriting. Well, basically when, when we write by, by hand, we're always searching, again, we go to the philosophical aspect of it, like we're always searching to the fastest and the quickest way to write what we need to write. It's not about calligraphy, which is the opposite. Calligraphy is like, the, the, the very patient uh, uh, artistic uh, craftsman approach. So it's very interesting that every person and every different nation or every different uh, head, they, they have their own maybe handwriting techniques and styles, and which is actually very interesting. It shows a lot about, about the personality and about the culture and heritage of the person writing. Um, how it translates to digitally, um, it can inspire you to do a typeface out of it, but it's very hard. It's, it's, again, it's the same topic as calligraphy. It's very hard to do a digital typeface that really mimics or looks like a handwritten spontaneous type. You have to add a lot of uh, alternates and ligatures and technology into the font that at some point it makes it a bit uh, crazy to, to work on it and very heavy and very, it's, it's very hard to mimic the handwriting. It's, uh, I would say handwriting is handwriting, calligraphy is calligraphy, and typography is typography. There are these three different words that, but um, there's also the, the science of studying uh, handwriting and psychology of it and analyzing characters. And so it's a very interesting world. Okay, great. Thanks. I don't know Noha. if I answered your question. <laughs> um, Okay, I'm going to ask a question for Jose, who said he can't, he doesn't have a microphone, and I'm going to combine his question with Fahed's question. Um, and the questions are, um, do you have any pointers to become a self-taught Arabic type designer? That's uh, Jose. And then Fahed said, he added in, can you give us advice or any links on where we can learn how to create Arabic typography step by step? Okay. Um... If I'd, at all, if, the, if there's a way to do it on your own. Well, it's it's really hard. Uh, I always say that type design as a profession, it's really like a, it's so different uh, than graphic design by itself and it's a world by itself. And to really become a professional type designer, you really, really have to understand all the different aspects of this, of this, end or this uh, skill or career or industry. It's not, I, I would say it's not easy uh, to always do it by uh, by yourself, but it's not it's not undoable. Um, 
um, you would have to understand this this craft or this skill from different aspects. You have to understand the historical part of it, the calligraphic part of it, the typographical part of it, and the techn technological part of it. Um, doing a typeface or a font, it's not only about learning the software uh, that makes you do this, this font. It's about learning the software, uh, learning the technology that you can use in the software to help you do the typeface you want to do. And before even going to the software and learning these technologies, you have to understand the script that you are designing. And you have to understand the autonomy of the script. And you have to understand how you can translate it from being traditional to contemporary without breaking from this beauty uh, culture heritage. So it's a, it's a, it's a mix of of understanding calligraphy, practicing calligraphy, doing Arabic uh, calligraphy workshops or any other script workshops to understand the script that you want to design. Next, you have to find a really interesting research topic to research about, to inspire from. Third, you have to really uh, decide which uh, software application you want to work on and really know all the tricks of it. And third, you have to know how to do coding, open type features, uh, Python scripting, uh, whatever, testing, um, all the coding that comes, uh, kerning, uh, kerning uh, hinting, or whatever is, it comes with it, which is very like the, the drawing part of the type design, it's maybe not more than, like the creative part of it is not more maybe than 25%, and the other 75% is all like technical work. Uh, to do yeah. the typeface. It seems like it seems like uh, an for Arabic, question. Sorry, go ahead. For Arabic, ju just to answer, I don't think there's one place that you can go and it gives you all the steps of doing a proper Arabic typeface. Uh, also, that every different type designer, Arabic type designer, they might have their different kind of ways of doing stuff, which is also valid for everyone. So, but sadly, I don't think there's one place or one source that you go to and it teaches you exactly all the different steps you need to follow. It's, I don't think this exists. Um, yeah. Okay. It sounds like it's the equivalent of like asking somebody like, how do you, how do you build a shoe? It's like, okay, you can draw it, but then, <laughs> then you have to make something that actually works and doesn't ruin somebody's foot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you can run a marathon and, okay. Yeah. Uh, Noelle is next. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, I think this is, follows up with this question. Just I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about more about some of the concepts or like visual elements behind Arabic typeface design. I mean, you mentioned kerning, you know, but are there certain elements that evoke different things to you in particular? Um, or I guess another way, you know, is there like an Arabic typeface version of Comic Sans to you, for example, or um, yeah. Um... I don't know if I, I, I fully understood the question. Can, um, do you mean that wh what is, I think I didn't understand the question. Can you, can you clarify? Yeah, I think, I think I just mean, are there's, so if you, you know, space out the letters more or if there's, the letters have more curvature, does that sort of, how do you, I was wondering if you could give examples of sort of different typefaces and what they, the elements that go into designing them. Yeah, and basically, if I want to speak in general, like if you look in our type catalog, um, there's more like the like the geometric uh, fonts and there's more like the cursive fonts. Uh, I would say in general that the more, the geometric ones, they need uh, less somehow uh, advanced um, uh, typographical work than the cursive ones. The more cursive you go, the more you need to do extra ligatures, uh, extra alternates, uh, worry more about uh, spacing and kerning and uh, et cetera, and open type features to make stuff work properly. The more geometric the goal, it's more simple it goes and the less typographical elements it goes. In, in Arabic, what we need to worry about is that uh, what are the different shapes for each letter you want to put in the font or not? What are the extra ligatures you want to add uh, to this font or not. Um, 
uh, which yeah, exactly then you have to go into spacing and kerning, but this applies to all fonts. It depends on the design. The, again, the more the more complex, the more uh, kerning would be uh, required, the, the less complex. So, um, Basically, as a as a as a as a general rule, it's like um, a typeface is a is a is a is a result of uh, of what you are trying to come up based on a certain style that you're referring a design on, or based on a certain research. So, uh, a a typeface that, that that is inspired from from handwriting will be more complex than typeface that is inspired from a square coffee, for example. And Okay, great. Um, I actually think this is, so we're close to the hour. Um, I wanted to make one final comment before I thank Pascal, which is your website, the 29 Letters website, is a coding masterpiece. And yeah. I highly recommend anyone to go on this website um, 29lt.com. It shows some of the things that um, Noel is asking about in terms of the dynamics, whether it's uh, size or weighting. Um, and in a strict a strike, uh, sort of strike of genius, it's like you can type in whatever you want in each font. Yeah. Um, which is, please walk me through how the hell you did <laughs> how uh, you did this. The website actually, it, it was a big challenge. It, it was more than two years of, of work. After design was done, it was like two years of work and consultancy between web developers and experts and UX and UI people uh, from Holland and from Madrid and from Lebanon. Uh, the challenge was that to make the, the website fully dynamic and to support all the different scripts, Arabic, Latin, Cyrillic, Greek, and others, uh, to make it accept variable font and static fonts. So like variable fonts because they, they have different accesses and different variations. Um, and to make it very strong and bold and um, only focusing about type, like only type. We don't want to see anything but type. We don't want to put images. We don't want to put uh, design. We, we, we want people to come to, to the website to see the fonts, to really see the beauty of these fonts and to play with them. Uh, and we have this very strong three colors, uh, white, yeah. red, and black. Uh, we redesigned our logo to reflect more our new uh, philosophy and for the letters that we focus on by scripture and even more kind of typeface, not only Arabic anymore. Um, the, the, the web developer was going crazy at some point. He was going to kill me at some point trying to make all the fonts work and all the features work. Uh, it's true, it was using HTML5 and a bit of Java in some places, but it, it was a big challenge for, for the web developer and for yeah. the- That's incredible. But I'm happy that you see it as a- It's a masterpiece. A it's a masterpiece. <laughs> so please uh, enjoy yourself on that website. Yeah, um, please visit I wanna... the website and- yeah, I want to wrap up. Um, I've pasted our feedback link into the chat. Please uh, take a look at that. Um, give us feedback, answer that one question. Was this good? This was super, super uh, enlightening. I hope you had a good time too. Yes, thank you for inviting me. It was a nice discussion. Everyone on the chat, have a great evening or day or morning, wherever you are. And if you want to join the upcoming events, go to africata.com slash RSVP. We got an event on Saturday. And then next week, Tuesday, Thursday, and rinse and repeat. Okay, everyone, be well. Talk to you soon. Bye.